Welcome to the first of two sessions on how to blog successfully. So um, my name's Kirsty Marins. I've been working in the charity sector since 2007 um, and I've been blogging since 2013. Uh, I think it was in 2015 I managed the Just Giving blog which was um, at that time rated the UK's number one non-profit blog by Vulio. I also write a monthly column for Third Sector, which is one of the leading publications in um, the not-for-profit sector. I also write um, lots of blog posts for numerous, numerous sector clients because I'm freelance and a consultant. And I also have a personal blog called What Kirsty Did Next. So I'm here today to show you everything I know about blogging um, and hopefully to help you with your blogging for Woodcraft Folk. So over to you. Um, you don't have to if you don't want to, but it would be great to know who we've got um, on the training tonight. So if you wouldn't mind just unmuting yourself quickly and just saying who you are um, and what you do and what your involvement in the project is. Um, I can call out names if you want, but if you don't want to say anything, that's fine. So we'll start with the first person I can see, which is Josh. That, that's me, right? Is yes. It's <laughs> also Josh. Uh, yeah, I'm Josh. I'm, I'm a PhD student at Cambridge. I work on gas lines. I'm involved in the project because of someone else in the meeting invited me to get involved. And uh, we'll be doing some talks to some talk academy uh, children soon. That's the first thing I'll be doing. Great. Thank you. Uh, Saul? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. So I've been like involved in like every permutation of like the facial elephant ingenious type project for like quite a few years. Okay. So um, yeah, I'm just kind of being involved, kind of give some involved input. I'm just a normal volunteer. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Great. Thank you very much, Colin. Yes. Hello. I'm Colin. I'm in Sheffield. Um, I'm a professional engineer, or I was, or I always are one, <laughs> um, a mechanical, uh, but I migrated in my career into a kind of technical sales and marketing and then more general kind of business consulting and marketing and communications. Um, and in fact, for the, I'm retired, uh, I have been for quite a while uh, from formal work, but for the last 10 years, I've been doing volunteer work overseas, but that's stopped now. Um, but in the education sector at the university level, so with uh, teaching business courses for university level students in Asia with, with a charity. Oh, wow. You yeah. have lots uh, of varied uh, experience. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm probably older than the rest of you. <laughs> well, I mean, I just mean different sectors and because I first started in the finance sector and now work in the charity sector. Um, but yeah, that's amazing. So thank you so much for joining okay. us tonight. Uh, Emily? Hi, I'm Emily. I'm a postdoc uh, researcher at the University of Oxford. Um, so my background is actually mainly in biomedical engineering. So I'm kind of joining this as a learning experience. I'd like to learn more about climate science and yeah, I'd like to kind of be able to get involved um, in projects in terms of outreach and um, yeah, a anything I'd like to use my engineering skills to help towards um, the climate crisis. Great. And um, are you joined by someone? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Steve. I'm Hi, Steve. Here, and I mainly do work for decommissioning of nuclear power plants and some work on fusion new build power plants. Like, I have an interest in energy and how it's made. Great. Well, thank you both for joining us. So who have we got next? Um, JHC? Hey, uh, Hello. I didn't realise it had just come up with my... Oh, hang on. I didn't realise it had just come up with my initials. I'm also Josh. Josh. Right. Hi, Josh. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Oxford. I mostly work on gas turbines, but I've worked on a little bit with wind turbines previously. So I'm quite interested in that aspect of it. Uh, and I was involved with Woody's for quite a while. I was 
in a group for a long time when I was a kid and then I was a group leader and I was involved in a couple of national committees so uh, it's quite nice to kind of come back and start being involved again. Oh brilliant well I'm sure they are delighted to have you back. So um, thanks everyone I think we've gone through everybody we've also got Lauren on um, the training with us from Woodcraft folks so Lauren I don't know if you just want to say hi if you don't don't worry. Hi everyone, I'm Lauren and I work with devs at Woodcraft Folk um, and at the moment I'm overseeing the online programme so I'm here as well in the background but I am here. Brilliant, thank you so much. Right, so just a few tips on using Zoom. I'm sure you have probably all been using it for months and you're experts uh, but just to go through um, a little bit of housekeeping, could I ask if you don't mind keeping your mic on mute? Uh, unless we're giving feedback, just in case there's any background noise. Um, please click the raise hand if you want to ask a question on it at any point and either unmute yourself or I can unmute you. You can also feel free to pop any questions into the chat box if you want. Um, but those ones I'll only answer at the end because obviously I can't really keep an eye on what's happening in the chat box um, whilst I'm doing the training. Um, also feel free to, you know, chat to each other if you want to, um, or share any experience in the chat box as well. I'm also gonna be sharing a few polls, so please participate. And yeah, if you have something you'd like to share from your own experience, please do. Uh, we're all here to learn from each other. So what we are going to cover today, oh, and sorry, just to say that this training is being recorded uh, just so that anyone who wasn't able to uh, make the training can watch it um, at their leisure. So what we are going to cover today is the benefits of blogging. We're also going to look at which platform because when I first spoke to Debs, um, she wasn't sure yet which platform uh, you would be using to write your blog post. So we're going to have a look at um, WordPress, which is the most common blogging platform, and then also Medium. And I'm gonna talk through the sort of pros and cons of both of those. We're then gonna look at what is CEO, which is CEO, <laughs> SEO, which means search engine optimization, and why is it important? I'm then gonna share some SEO top tips with you. We're going to look at how to create a blog content plan and then the 10 elements of a good blog. And then at the end, I will share with you what we will be covering on Thursday. But before we begin, I'd really like to know what you're looking to get out of today's session, just so I can make sure that when I'm delivering the training, I'm sort of covering what you really want to know. So if you wouldn't mind um, just quickly unmuting yourself uh, and letting me know what you'd like to get out of today's session, that would be great. Um, and yeah, if, if you don't have any expectations, that's fine. But anybody who wants to share what you're looking to get out specifically of the session, uh, just let me know. The content plan stuff sounds really good. Okay, great. Before and kind of muddled my way through it and had like 10 posts in a month and then none for two months. So. Yeah, okay, got it. <laughs> Yes, I'll, I'll second that and also just your top tips, really. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know about CO because I do marketing, but that, that's another story. Okay, great. Well, and hopefully you can share some of your SEO tips with us then, Colin. Well, I don't do <laughs> active marketing on social media, so that's not the same. Okay, fair enough. Anyone else? If not, we can move on. Okay. So I've got a very quick poll for you. Um, oh, wrong one. So could you share with us, what is your experience of blogging? None at all. Some, for example, you've maybe written a blog post before. Is it fairly advanced so you can upload and publish posts yourself without any help? Or are you expert? So if you wouldn't mind just answering that. Great. So I think everybody has answered. So we've got, okay, so the majority, majority of you have no experience of blogging at all. So 
that's good news for me because then you're on the right course. Uh, one person has some experience, so they've written a blog post before, um, and one person is fairly advanced, can upload and publish posts. Great. Nobody's an expert. Okay. Um, I was going to say, if you're an expert, feel free to jump in any time and um, share your experience with us. Great. So let's move on to the benefits of blogging. So the benefits of blogging is that it builds brand awareness. Um, so obviously you would be um, guest blogging for Woodcraft folk. So you, if the blog were to be, for example, hosted on their website, you would be helping to build brand awareness for them and also driving people to their website. And how you would be doing this is through a combination of SEO, which we will talk about, and content marketing. And by content marketing, that includes things like um, email marketing and social media. The benefit of blogging is that it also provides content for your marketing. So if you have an email newsletter, for example, then having regular blogs can add content for that newsletter and also can help provide content for social media. It also can establish you or the organization as thought leaders and experts in that field. And long form content can really engage your audience a lot more than short form content can, such as social media. And it also creates opportunities for sharing. So when you have a blog post, you have social media icons, for example, um, either at the top or the bottom or even down the side, depending on the way the blog is formatted. And that makes it easy for anybody reading that blog who is enjoying that content to then easily share it to their audience on social media, which again then goes back to building brand awareness and driving people to your website. So we're gonna have a look at the two different platforms. So has everyone heard of WordPress? I'm sure you probably have, but there are actually two different um, kinds of WordPress. So there is one that is completely free, which is called wordpress.org. And then there is one that is paid, which is called wordpress.com. And the difference is that obviously the wordpress.com, which is the paid one, has a lot more flexibility in terms of um, it's ad free, for example, and you can have your own domain name and you have a lot more options when it comes to the theme. So how your blog looks, so the kind of design and the layout of it. So that would obviously be the one I would recommend over the free version. Um, and as I said, Deb said that it's possible that the blog would probably be hosted on Woodcraft folks website. So it would sit as part of the website. So wordpress.com can do that. It can sit within a website. So the pros are, if any of you have ever used WordPress, it's quite easy to use. It's, um, you know, it's very user friendly. The uh, user experience is really good. It's quite intuitive. Um, you know, you could watch a tutorial video and it would be quite easy to just create a blog post. You can also have multiple authors. So each one of you can be set up as an author so that whatever blog post you write and create is in your name. And that is really important for this project, I think, because obviously all of you will have probably different areas that you are um, expert in or have an interest in. And it's just really good to have your names on those blog posts. There are also lots of free plugins that you can use to enhance your blog. So um, these are things such as you can add a subscription box um, so that people can sign up and subscribe so that every time you publish a blog post, they will get an email to say that you have published a blog post. You can also, as I said before, add your social media icons so people can you know, click on the little Twitter icon and it will formulate a tweet for them that they can then share to Twitter that will drive people back to your blog. Um, WordPress.com is also indexed by Google and other search engines, which is obviously really good for SEO. 
And of course you get some analytics. So you get, um, you'll know how many visits you've had, so how many page views, um, where people are reading your blog, such as the UK, the US, um, how long they're spending on your blog and all of that kind of useful um, information that is uh, good to know. Um, but the cons are that it can sometimes be a bit glitchy. So a good example for you is my, um, what Kirsty did next blog is six, I think it's six years old. And the other day I was trying to edit a really old blog post, probably about, you know, four years old. And it just wouldn't bring up the blog post for me to edit. And I could not figure out why it wouldn't load it so that I could edit it. So I belong to a blogging group on Facebook. So I asked the question, is anyone else having this issue? Um, I don't really know what to do. And someone said to me, oh, it's the classic editor. You need to install the classic editor plugin. So I did that and then lo and behold, I can now edit those old blog posts. So sometimes it can be glitchy. It just suddenly stops working and you have to figure out what the problem is. Uh, but once you know the problem and the solution, it is fairly easy to fix. So the cons, when I say it's quite technical, it can be. Um, I'm not a massively technical person and I've managed to install all my own plugins and, um, you know, kind of make my blog look how I wanted to. Uh, what I did need help with was installing the theme. So for those kinds of things, it can be a little bit technical. Also with the paid WordPress, it does need to be hosted. So um, the free one is hosted by WordPress, but the reason it's free is like I mentioned before, they often have adverts that sit within your blog posts, um, which for an organization, I would really recommend not having that because you don't have any control over what those adverts are. Um, they should be sort of, um, they should align with what your content is about, but they don't always. And as I said, you have no control over that. So that's why I really recommend getting the paid version. Um, however, of course, if it's going to be sitting on Woodcraft folks' own website, then they've got the hosting anyway. And as I said, it's not free. So WordPress.com isn't free. However, it is not very expensive at all. And it's definitely worth paying the money to have um, the ad-free version and the one that gives you a lot more flexibility and a lot more, um, yeah, the ability to kind of design it how, how you want. So Medium, I, um, if there are a few of you on here who are quite avid Twitter users, you will probably see quite a lot of people sharing Medium posts. So Medium is, um, I, I can't remember if it still is. It, I think it was um, started by one of the kind of co-founders of Twitter or something like that. So essentially it's a free blogging platform um, that has a built-in audience. So what I mean by that is when you create a post on Medium, Medium actually shows people your posts. Uh, they have something called um, Hot Topics for Industries. So, um, you know, yours would fall into maybe um, engineering or climate change or environment. And if they think that your blog is really good, then it will feature in those hot topics. Also, um, they have this thing called hearts. So if people like your blog post, then uh, the more hearts you get, the more people Medium will show your blog post to you. So it's a bit like an algorithm. If you think of Facebook and the way that Facebook posts have algorithms, um, Medium has the same thing. It also tells you how many people read your post and for how long. Um, so, and it also tells you, although you can also get a plug on a plugin for WordPress that does the same thing. What is quite interesting is when people click on your medium post, it actually tells them how long the read is. So it'll tell them if it's going to take them five minutes or seven minutes or 12 minutes, um, to read the blog post, which I think is quite useful. And the good thing about medium is that 
you can either publish directly onto Medium or you can use their import tool, which lets you upload uh, your content from your website or another blog like WordPress. So I think that's quite a, a cool feature. So the cons of um, Medium, so it also has multiple authors. So you can create multiple authors under one umbrella, but it's not as easy to use as WordPress. It is, um, it's not that user friendly. I've tried to use Medium and I didn't find it that easy at all, even though I've been blogging for seven years. Also, another con is that, you know, if you are looking for sort of brand awareness, it doesn't sit on your website. It's a completely different, um, it, think of it almost like a social channel. So it's like a Twitter or a Facebook. It sits completely independently. It's also not good for SEO. It actually has really low visibility on search engines. So unlike WordPress, which gets indexed by Google, um, it, it, medium posts just don't seem to have that or they, they don't surface as much as WordPress blog posts do. So this is just a very, uh, what's the word, a quick little uh, image of what a medium sort of blog looks like. So this is the Cancer Research UK tech team's blog. So the technology team at Cancer Research UK they have a blog about how they're becoming a more adaptable, resilient, and innovative organization, and, in, and that they're helping to ensure that three in four people survive cancer by 2034. So if you have a look, um, if you're on Medium yourself, you can then follow them. So that means that you will always get to see their blog posts. Now, the same thing happens with WordPress. People can also, who also had a word, have a WordPress blog can also follow your blog, which means that they will see your blog posts um, as well, whenever you post them. So if you have a look, you've got different authors. So the first one is Rachel Jones. And as you can see underneath, she posted on the 7th of September and it says eight minute read. So that's what I meant when I said it has like a handy feature that tells you how long it will potentially take you to read that blog post. Uh, then we've got another one. Um, oh, sorry. Then we have got another one by Snez Halacheva, uh, another one by Catherine Howe, another one by Tiffany Hall. So you can see that it really is a team, uh, a team effort. And if you clicked into the blog post, you'd obviously be able to read it. If you clicked on the author name, you would then see all of the blog posts that Rachel has posted. So it's quite nice. Um, it is very clean looking. However, unlike WordPress, you don't have really any control over the design and the layout of Medium. So if you were to set it up like this, this is kind of the layout that you would have. So what I would recommend is actually having both WordPress and Medium. And the reason I say that is because Medium has that very simple import tool. I think it's good to just get that added reach and to get more people viewing your blog. However, I would say you publish it on WordPress and WordPress is essentially your blogging platform, but then you can import it to Medium as I said, just for more visibility and added reach. So think of Medium as more of a marketing tool to work in conjunction with your WordPress blog. So we were going to have a quick break, but it's only uh, 20, half an hour into our session. So I will skip that for now. I can see there are a couple of questions. So I will go um, just to the group chat now to see what there is. So Josh has said, can you use the import tool to import your WordPress blog onto Medium and have both? Ah, so I think I've just answered that question, Josh. Yeah, so, I'll, I'll start immediately before. <laughs> that's fine, no problem, that's great. Uh, so yes, as I, as I said, yes, I would recommend having both just for that um, extra visibility. 
So Colin has said Medium has a subscribe system for readers, sends general updates daily of all content that I'm interested in, more like commentary op-ed pieces. So Colin, um, could you just clarify, do you mean, well, that's great, but are they actually really sending you content that you are interested in? Or do you feel like you're just getting a whole bunch of like, um, maybe posts that are doing really well on Medium and they've got a lot of traction, but are not necessarily that interesting to you? Do you want to share um, what yeah, you mean by that? It, it, I, it's yet another of these kind of news feed things that's coming to one of my Google email accounts, well, my general personal one. Mm -hmm. because okay. I think I found something, notwithstanding your comment about its low search engine yes. rate, I, I, I guess I found some, some article or one or more on it some time ago now. It must be some months ago. A lot of this has started during lockdown because uh, I at least have been spending more time online rather sure. than being about and traveling and whatever. And... Uh, um, or actually just in the UK <laughs> and therefore online. Uh, and yeah, I was looking at my, one of my interest areas in all things green mm -hmm. and alternative economics and things like that. And I guess that popped up uh, from some searching and then I ended up, I think, subscribing or registering my email and then you get a, a daily digest with about six or eight articles on whatever the relevant topics okay. are decided by them by right. some algorithm uh, okay. frankly it goes into my promotions mm -hmm. inbox section which i rarely look at so i don't it doesn't exactly get much visibility but sure. it, it, it does do that but it's a different model to i mean any wordpress blogs i've never actually followed anybody but wordpress blogs obviously are what I would call more like a pure blog rather than a news stream or a commentary stream, which yes. means it tends to be sort of hybrid in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think Medium is used a lot for more like commentary pieces mm. or sort of like yeah. opinion pieces yeah. because I guess they're, it's people, I guess, reacting to the news and because it's so easily shared on social media and it has that kind of inbuilt audience, I think that it's great for getting maybe a lot of traction quite quickly. Um, but I think you're right. It's not the same as WordPress in terms of building a community, for example. I don't think it has the same sort of, um, you know, WordPress is really, you know, when you think of WordPress, you think of blogging and you think of the blogging community whereas Medium does seem to be a bit more of a news kind of media, you know, almost like a BBC type thing. Um, you don't often see people commenting on Medium posts, for example. Or, or, I do think or almost an echo chamber, actually, to be honest. Yeah. Because of the way its algorithm works, I think. Yes, yeah, I see what you mean. Um, but thank you for sharing that with us. I mean, in, in one way, I guess it is good, though, that it does sound like they are curating um, at least the right sector for you, um, even if it's going into your promotional inbox and you're not really looking at it. Um, it's good that you're not getting, you know, sort of medium posts on celebrities or anything that's not particularly relevant. So that's quite good to know. Um, I guess, you know, people have their different what's the word, preferences as well. Um, I'm very much, I, I definitely read blogs on Medium, but I have not personally signed up for a Medium blog myself. So, you know, even when I want, I couldn't comment on one, even if I wanted to. Um, that's, I think, the problem with Medium as well, is that you can't, you can't comment if you don't have an account. Yes, Josh, did you want to say something? Yes, sorry, I've got lots of controls going on. Um, you said that Medium's like just, I, I, I'm struggling to understand how it's any different from Twitter or Facebook or Instagram because it sounds like there's lots of keywords that I'm picking up that sound like echo chamber, you know, reacting to the news. Mm -hmm. or, so I was wondering if, if you could explain that. Yeah, I mean, I guess it, it's, it's just long form content, really. So, um, the, as you know, with Twitter, you've only got 280 characters. 
So you've only got, you've got to be really succinct. And Twitter started as a micro blogging platform, which is what they still are in a way. Um, and I think what happened with Medium, it was the opportunity for people to be able to say a lot more than 280 characters. Um, and it's a few years old now. So Twitter's obviously, they've introduced other features that allow you to say more than 280 characters through threads. So, um, you know, you can tweet and then you can reply to your own tweet and you can reply again and you can basically have, you know, this long thread of probably 20 tweets if you really wanted to. Um, so that feature, you know, if that feature had existed four or five years ago, I'm not sure we would even have Medium. I think it was just a way for people primarily on Twitter to be able to say a lot more than those 280 characters allowed them is, is what I think. Thank you very much. So, oh, good. Okay. So Colin, you've said uh, it's probably why you have a Medium account because you wanted to comment. So that, that's good to know. Yeah, because I disagreed profoundly with some rubbish that somebody was writing. I've already wasted my time, but uh, one gets tempted sometimes. Did they, did they reply to you though? So when you commented, did they at least reply and like engage in no, conversation? No, they didn't. They uh, didn't. It, so it wasn't like a Facebook uh, uh, ding dong, you know, like this. Right echo chamber sort of or, 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 or on the other hand the conspiracy theories and so mm -hmm. on yeah, that's another thing yeah. yes okay well i mean the point of blogging is well one of the points of blogging is to have that dialogue and that conversation so i mean technically they should really have replied um perhaps they <laughs> they thought they'd been caught out so they, they i didn't. think my <laughs> argument was probably irrefutable <laughs> Right, so they just so they pretended yeah. to ignore it. <laughs> I think that I think they published some rubbish about economics that was obviously wrong. So I told them where to get off, and they shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Um, okay, so we're not going to have a quick break now, just because it's too early. I'm, I'm apologies, I've not got my timings right, but we will have a we will have a break a bit further on. Um, but before I move on, are there any other questions at the moment or are you happy for me to move on? And I'm sure there'll be lots of other questions in, in the rest of the training. Okay, by the silence, I will just assume that then it's good for me to move on. So we're going to look at what is C SEO. I don't know why I keep saying CEO. I'm sorry about that. I think it's because I've been talking to a few CEOs lately and now it's just stuck in my brain. So what is SEO and why is it important? So I said before that SEO stands for search engine optimization and a search engine is something like Google or Bing or anywhere that people go and search online, um, you know, a browser. So in a nutshell, SEO is really answering questions that people are searching for on search engines such as Google. So, and I, I'm just going to talk about Google for now, just because it's, I guess, the biggest, um, most well-known search engine. So all Google really wants to do is just serve at the best, most relevant answer to the question that somebody is typing in that search box. So I've got an example here for you. I did a search on what is climate change for kids? And the top three um, searches that came up was this one on what is climate change? Facts for kids by National Geographic Kids. Then the next one is from the Climate Reality Project, which is a charity just for kids. What's climate change and what can I do probably about it? I didn't see what the rest of... Um, rest of it was. And then uh, the last one is um, from c2es.org, which is um, another charity. So Climate Basics for Kids, Center for Climate and Energy. So those were the top three searches that came up when I Googled that question. And there's a number of reasons why they would have come up as those top three, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, but essentially, the reason why they came up is because um, they have the keywords. So they've got the words climate change and kids 
which is exactly what I put in the search box. Um, they also have high quality relevant content and they probably have things like a lot of um, other uh, websites linking to them, which um, tells Google that they have sort of authority. So what is SEO? It's really, as I said, about developing quality content to get you at the top of those relevant Google searches. Um, so being on the, on the first page of Google when you search a question is really important um, because most people don't really scroll past the first page. You might get a few people scrolling to the second and the third, but they don't tend to scroll beyond that. So it is really important to be at least in the top two pages of that particular search. It's also about providing useful content that people are searching for. And by useful, I mean, you're actually answering the question that they asked. Um, it's also about making sure that your site is accessible. And we're gonna talk through some accessibility tips later on, but it's things like making sure that your font is not too small, that you um, are describing the images in your posts so that people who are maybe visually impaired, they, their screen readers will read that out rather than them just having a blank space. And then it's also about optimizing your blog and your posts for Google. And that's about making sure that you have, you know, the right keywords, that you have um, internal and external links, that you have um, scannable content. And we're gonna talk about all of that in a little bit more detail. So why is it important? Well, because if you're not optimizing your content, it means that you're really missing out on readers. So, you know, when you have your, when you create your blog, you of course have the option to have a subscribe button. So you can, um, you know, ensure that people who, who want to receive all of your blog posts can. So they will give you your, give you their email address and then they will get a blog post when you have published it, or if you have a different plugin, you might have one that's um, more of a newsletter plugin. So that means you will send out a newsletter, just say weekly or monthly, and you will include um, links to, you know, three or four or five of your blog posts. So there are a few different ways that you can do that. Obviously, um, if you're on WordPress, uh, there is um, the WordPress app, for example, um, or even desktop, people have the ability to follow you on WordPress. So that means when they are on WordPress, they can go to a section called Reader. And what it'll do is it'll show them um, all of the blog posts that they follow. It will show the latest posts. So that's another way, of course, that you can get people to read your blog. Um, WordPress also has a discover feature. So it will then um, share blog posts that are relevant to that person, depending on what other blogs they follow and what other blogs they like. And of course, with social media, you can promote your blogs and you know, that's how you're getting people to read your content. However, probably the top source or at least the top two or three sources of traffic to your blog post will be organic. And by organic, we mean people going into Google and searching a, you know, a phrase or a question. So that's why it's really important to optimize your content. So those people searching those questions are going to be served your content. And so remember in um, here, these top three searches. So this one on what is climate change for kids, those top three searches essentially 60% of traffic from that organic Google search will go to those top three search results. And the reason for that is obviously because one, they are answering the question. Um, they also, if you do look at who they are, you know, we've got National Geographic for Kids, we've got Climate Reality Project, um, you know, so they also have authority. So you trust what they are saying. Um, but what that means is if you're below those top three, 
you're still going to get traffic, but you're not going to have the 60% that those top three search results have. So the higher up we can get on Google search, the better. So I talked about accessibility. So some tips for accessibility is um, font. So to make sure that your font is legible. Uh, so that means, you know, don't use a font that's sort of like handwriting or cursive, um, because for a lot of people, it's really difficult to read it, um, especially people who are dyslexic. Also make sure that your font is large enough, at least 14 points. Um, because you don't want people to have to zoom in to, you know, read what you're saying. Also avoid italics and lots of uppercase text. It's really not good for accessibility at all. So in terms of links, so this is when you are writing a blog post and maybe you're talking about, let's just say Blue Planet, for example, um, maybe there's been an article on the BBC that David Attenborough has written and you want to link to that. That's what we call an external link. So when you're adding an external link inside your blog post, you need to be as descriptive as possible. So instead of saying, you know, um, this, uh, so David Attenborough has written about how um, Blue Planet came about and the impact of Blue, Blue Planet um, and how we're all, you know, trying to become um, better at, you know, not using plastic, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Don't say, you know, click here or read the article here. What you need to do is hyperlink it to a phrase. So I gave you that example, but now I've given you a different example on the phrase. So let's just say it was a article about you know offshore wind energy then you would say this article on offshore wind energy and the reason for that is so people actually know what you're directing them to and again for people who are using screen readers it will then tell them what the link is taking them to oh I've gone past so images Images are really important in blog posts. One, because it obviously adds a bit more color, it makes them more engaging, but it also includes, um, adds something very useful, which is what we call white space. So when somebody is reading a blog post, even if the blog post is really interesting, nobody just wants to see a bunch of text or copy. You know, it's really important to break up um, the copy with images and we also call that white space but it's super important for people who are visually impaired that you add alt text to the image and alt text is basically describing what the image is so if you upload an image of a turtle uh, swimming in the sea and it's surrounded by plastic and you probably know the image I'm, I'm talking about then the alt text should say something like a turtle swimming in the sea whilst plastic floats past, just so that people actually know what that image is. Um, it's not good to just, you know, have the image and, and no alt text at all. And then lastly, in terms of accessibility, it's really important to have scannable copy. And that just means making it really easy to read. And how you do that is by having headings by using subheadings, having bullet points. So instead of having, you know, lots and lots of paragraphs, you can vary them, whereas where one of the paragraphs could really be bullet points. And again, as I said, images to break the copy and to create white space, and also to have sentences that vary in length. So, you know, you don't want to have really, really long sentences and that every paragraph has really long sentences. You want to have some that are fairly long, some that are really short and snappy, um, and, you know, again, ones that are maybe slightly longer. In the next session, we're going to be doing some writing tips, but just uh, a top tip for now is that a sentence should never be longer than 30 words. So just, you know, make sure that when you're writing, your longest sentence is under 30 words. 
I think, did someone have a question? Yeah, let me go to the questions now just before we move on. Um, oh, that's odd, I can't see a question. Did someone have one? If you wanted to, you can just... I was asking about images in WordPress because most of the WordPress blogs that I've read tend to be just text, but that's probably because they're very boring and un <laughs> not visual topics. Like they're right. actual philosophical topics of one sort or another. I see. Whereas okay. for us, definitely, we want, we want some nice images because we're going to be talking about tech things and... Yes. In that case, an image is worth a thousand words, as they say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's interesting because um, I see what you mean. If it's sort of like a philosophical post, then maybe it's quite hard to find an image for that. But there are other ways, I guess, to create. You can create an image or create at least um, some variants by doing like quotes. So um wordpress and uh, medium as well they have a feature where you can kind of pop out a, a really good quote so it stands out and it's a lot um bigger um and i think medium also has the ability where you can kind of highlight a really interesting part of the post that stands out a lot more so it looks slightly different so it kind of looks like an image but it's still text um, but again, if you wanted to, you could even create um, an image that's a quote. So you could brand it, you know, you could have the, you know, Woodcraft Folk logo in it, for example. Um, or, you know, you could just do a nice background and have, yeah, have stars or whatever it is in the background. It's obviously, as long as the text is still easy to read. So yes, there are, I mean, I think it is really important to have images and you're right, Colin, the topics that you're writing about, it's very easy to find images. Um, and in the next training, I'm going to show you how to source images that you can use for your blog posts that will be copyright free um, because you definitely don't want to be caught out using a copyrighted image. Uh, coming back to the, the SEO question, uh, mm -hmm. isn't another point the frequency of updating the content yes. on the blog page Absolutely. or the website? Uh, yes. Because the, the search engines don't actually do a search when you do a search, as I understand it. And the most no, they're indexing, they're, yeah. They're, they're indexing the web continuously yes. on an algorithmic basis with, with keywords and so on. And and so you need to be actually producing new content or at least an update of some sort so that it identifies it as a changed yes text, which it then passes and 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 finds the uh scans i should say and, and finds the keywords yeah. yeah absolutely um so i that's coming up <laughs> in the seo top tips but yeah you're absolutely okay. right yeah. colin yeah. so um and the other thing i hope we never get into this but i'm aware that sometimes people get negative news about themselves and again the way to bury that on the internet you can't take it down it's almost impossible but what you can do is bury it by having lots and lots of other neutral and positive stories afterwards which therefore mean it goes down onto the second page of the google search yeah well i mean i thought google now had the right to be forgotten so if there's something negative that's been written do you mean personally or do you mean well i'm talking yeah, that's the stories i'm aware of are people who've had something embarrassing or, or even scandalous or criminal or something about them which may or may not really be true but it's become a sort of a uh, you know a viral story and a sort right. of a lot of hits and and basically they need to get rid of it in order to make it if any if they're applying for a job you know yes. there's people google mm -hmm. them and find what comes up. This is normal HR practice now in many yeah. jobs. Mm -hmm. and, and they need to bury it because it was something embarrassing they did at college 10 years ago, but it's still there, you know, yeah. like, like, like uh, our prime minister's Oxford club or whatever, you know, that sort of story. Now, that sort of thing people will dig up on famous people, but ordinary mm -hmm. people need to, need to get rid of it. And you can't take it down, even, even with the Google right to forget. It doesn't, doesn't really work, I think. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. 
I mean, but as you say, who employed somebody to do it for them. They couldn't afford the time to create stories. And wow. they employed somebody to create blogs about their favorite recipes and the new cake that they'd experimented with and, and some other little city trip visit that they made. You know, it's just true things. But mm -hmm. basically, this person created all the content and kept uploading it for them uh, over the period of a couple of months in order to suppress this embarrassing personal story. Gosh. That is very interesting. And, and as you say, I hope nobody here experiences that. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that. we won't get into that, but uh, it, it, it's interesting to know that. Yes, absolutely. Sorry, I keep going. Right, I think we have another, oh, couple of questions. Uh, let me get to the chat box. Um, oh, are we expecting bad news for our project? Uh, that's from Josh. I can't answer that. I hope not. <laughs> um, I guess you'd have to ask Debs or Lauren. Uh, Lauren, I don't know if you're able to answer that right now. Um, so, so lawyers are good as a plan B. Uh, are any of you lawyers? <laughs> I, don't, I hope, I don't think we'll get into that kind of territory. So hopefully not. Um, but Lauren, yeah, I don't know if you can shed some light on expecting any bad news for the project. Sorry, I was just um, out of the sink for a second. Any bad news in terms of which? Oh, so we were just, um, so Colin was sharing how um, sometimes you can have like a negative story about a person or an organization. So when somebody Googles that name or that organization's name, that one might come up top. So the way to get rid of that is to create lots of positive content that with those <coughs> keywords that then sort of pushes that negative story down Google and hopefully onto the second, third, fourth page that then no one really sees. So yeah, I think Josh was saying, are we expecting any bad news for our project or anything negative that could um, come up? Because I guess climate changes, you know, it is a bit of a contentious subject for some people. Uh, there are lots of climate deniers. So I guess, is that what you meant, Josh? Like, you know, are we expecting maybe, um, you know, people to, to kind of, yeah, sort of yeah, disagree with a lot of things that you're whether, blogging whether, about? I, I was just wondering whether we're going to need to know how to drown out bad news for our blogs or not, really. Yeah. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know, I, I really hope not. And at the moment, we've been generating a lot of things during lockdown about like resources and our new kind of resource-based website. So mostly at the moment, I think if you sort of Google Woodcraft Folk, hopefully the most of it is positive. The most of kind of uh, criticism that we've been having recently is is not to do with climate change, but to do with identity and that sort of thing so right That's there, there is the negative news in the sense of you know we're sorry this isn't happening this isn't can't this is for sure yeah yeah yeah, that, and, yeah. And, and overcoming that and getting maximum exposure for what is happening as opposed to what's had to be cancelled um now now we're past that phase i suppose so so ra rather than really bad news or scandal about the chief executive which i'm sure won't happen um or or something of that sort so so just to have the positive story mm. but but also i think just isn't it just the frequency of it that you know if you have nothing new for a month then you fall down the ratings as well um yeah. no that not not necessarily because it depends on what your what your blog is about so you know you could have so i'll give you an example um i wrote a blog i haven't checked it late end which was something like um the top free resources for charities something like that and this blog post is now about four years old yet if you google that if you google like you know best free resources for charities it is the top and not only that it's even created a snippet so you know how Google, if your content is really, really relevant and has a lot of traffic, then it creates a little snippet for you. So it kind of gives a synopsis of the post before people will then click to read the rest. Um, and that hasn't even been updated 
in ages, even though it's the perfect blog post for updating. And just a caveat, they're not a client anymore. So that's also why I haven't updated it. Um, but that's a perfect blog post that even though it's an existing one, it's very easy to update because there are always going to be new, free, interesting resources for charities. So, um, you know, but like I said, that one hadn't been updated for absolutely ages, but because it's those exact keywords that, you know, it, it, um, it will be at the top. But if you're thinking of the, the client, so the client's name is Lightful. So if I Google Lightful, um, you're right. So if, you know, it, they haven't had a lot of blog posts in a while that, you know, maybe they would have surfaced quite high, but then if they're not creating content, they might drop down. But it depends on the um, competing keywords as well if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it occurs to me that, that we probably need to include UK because that's our target market geographically, whereas mm -hmm. the, the web searches go everywhere. And it's a problem that I find when I'm doing a search myself, I often put UK at the end of it in order to avoid going to, to all the first page of the... The, the, the results being US sites, you know, if it's, for example, trying to source information or, or even a supplier or something relevant to the UK. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, I guess it depends on what the content of the blog post is, because, you know, if it's something fairly general, then it is of interest to everyone. And it almost doesn't matter if someone in the US reads it. But if it's a blog post specifically about um like a project in the uk like the eden, eden project for example um then yes you're right it should include the uk in that or if it's you know like top um climate change resources for kids in the uk because yeah. all of your sources are going to be uk then yes absolutely it needs to say that because you're right then you know you're going to have people coming from the us and then they're going to be like well well that's not really interesting to me because it's not applicable to me. So um, I'm just going to quickly talk through the SEO top tips and then, yeah, please continue to ask questions. It's really good. Um, I'm really glad we're having all of this discussion. So the top tips are obviously high quality, relevant content. And it's exactly what I showed you before. So when I typed that question into Google, um, those three searches that came up are because they basically exactly answered the question I had put into Google. And if you click on them, you know, they are high quality because they will have headings, subheadings, and they're actually talking about what they say they're talking about. Um, because there are a lot of, you know, companies that might as a way to their kind of company or actually reading that can be am like um, but those blogs will never be those top three so another top tip is to use search for any urls so um, again it's about thinking what people what their questions are around your topic so what would they type into google and that's a really good way to think about what your heading is going to be um, as I said, we're going to be doing writing tips in the next session on Thursday, but in terms of headings, it's really important to think of, you know, the answers people are looking for rather than to have a heading that's quite um, maybe ambiguous or trying to be clever or trying to, you know, when you think, oh, if I type this, will it make people intrigued enough to click on it? No, people just want, they want to, you know, they're searching for something specific and they just want the answer to that. So that's also what we mean about search for any URLs. Um, and also uh, when you, if you're using WordPress, for example, um, or even Medium, the heading is usually the URL, but you do have the option to shorten it slightly. So it's not, you know, very, very long, uh, especially if you have a very long heading. 
Um, we've already spoken about adding those image descriptions. As I said, it's really, really important for, um, for accessibility, but it actually can help drive traffic as well to your blog. So sometimes, um, and I don't know if you've ever done this, but I certainly have, I Google something, it's usually just say a travel destination because I'm looking for certain information, but I will click on the images tab on Google and then it brings up all of the relevant images which are attached to a website or a blog. Um, so I know I've had some traffic through my personal blog randomly on a, um, a certain dish from Prezzo, the Italian restaurant. Um, I don't know why people are searching for that dish, looking at the photos or images tab on Google, and then my blog is coming up and they're clicking on it. So it's also important for that to have some, some you know, uh, visibility and drive people to your, your blog. And then as uh, Colin was saying, you do need to have fresh content. Um, and I would recommend at least one blog, new blog per week. Um, because there are quite a lot of you, it could be even that you post more than that. So, you know, we are gonna be talking about how to create a content plan. Um, so, you know, it could be that you decide because there are enough of you that, you know, you're going to post twice a week, for example. And as Colin was saying, that is really important for indexing um, because it, it, one, it tells Google that your blog is still active. Um, and of course, it's um, just indexing that new content. So it is really important to blog regularly um, and to be consistent about it so I think Josh you mentioned earlier that you've sometimes been quite inconsistent you've maybe blogged you know 10 times a month and then you've the next month you've blogged once um, so yeah it is quite important to be consistent and hopefully when we get on to the content planning um, I can give you some tips around that so another SEO top tips is obviously just about sharing on social media so you can share directly from the blog. Um, and obviously people can, if they're reading your blog post, they can share it to their own networks. Um, that is obviously then going to be shown in your Google Analytics. Um, you can have a look. I mean, I don't know if you'll have access to these analytics, but you know, Woodcraft folk can have a look at how much traffic is being driven to your blog through social media. Then some other tips are about linking to internal posts and linking to external posts. So what we mean by that is um, it's always important to have links in your blog post. So an external link is like I said before, when you're linking to another blog post or another article on BBC um, or maybe even a YouTube video, or potentially it's a you know, link to a academic article, whatever it is, it's important that you have those external links. However, you have to link to the relevant topic. So just to give you a very basic example, if you were talking about um, an article on the BBC that is a report about uh, you know, the latest figures in climate change around the world. What you have to do is link directly to that article, not link to BBC, because that is not linking to the relevant content, if that makes sense. So it's not helpful at all. Um, probably a more relevant example is if you were talking about on your blog, you were talking about the work that Woodcraft Folk does. Maybe you're talking about their history. So instead of, again, just linking to Woodcraft Folk's home page, what you need to do is link to the page that says our history or about us, because that tells um, Google, the search engines, that that is the relevant content. Now, linking to internal posts is about linking to your own blog posts that are relevant to the new blog post. Uh, and it's really important to set up what we call 
a blogging tree. So if you think about the trunk of the tree is maybe your niche topic. So let's just say your niche topic is talking about zero waste. Then every other article that talks about some kind of topic to do with zero waste, you know, like 10 top tips to, you know, improve your zero waste, that always needs to link back to the first article. And then vice versa, when you have a new blog post on zero waste, you need to link back to the original article. But again, you have to, you have to make sure it's relevant. So you have to say, you know, whatever that first blog post was called um, or work it in some way like that. So internal links and external links are really important for SEO. And having other sites linking to you is one of the best ways to improve your um, SEO. And a good example of this is, and again, it's also about relevancy and quality of that website. So let's just say you write a blog post on top resources for primary school, primary school teachers to teach kids about climate change. Let's say that's your blog post. Um, now, if you have TES uh, linking to that blog post in an article they're writing on that topic, that tells Google that your content is really relevant. And because TES is such a high quality, um, you know, it's a website for teachers. So that tells Google that um, your content is really relevant and will then boost you up the search rankings. So I'll very quickly mention something called domain authority. So that is a score uh, that you can tell how relevant your blog is according to your kind of niche topics. So um, TES probably has a DA of probably anywhere between 80 and 99, I would say. So the BBC, for example, The Guardian is 99, which is pretty much the highest. Um, if you have one of those websites linking back to you in a relevant blog post, it will help really help boost your domain authority. So typically a really good blog um, will have a domain authority between probably 40 and kind of 55. Um, so yeah, that's something to aim towards. And as I said, one of the best ways to increase your domain authority is to have other sites that have a domain authority higher than yours linking back to relevant content. So I'm just having a look quickly through the chat to see if I've missed anything here. So Saul, I think this is more about the project, but I'll read it out anyway. Does everything for the project have to be UK based? As I have a lot of contacts all over the place that could have interesting stories and linked blogs for solidarity. Um, so Colin's saying, I think sources of infotech case studies, no problem. But thinking of the sponsor, um, UK RAC of England, I'm, that's short for something, I'm sure, and target audience. The so, Royal Academy of Engineering. Ah, uh, that's the one. They're the, they're the project sponsor. Got it. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, I think it definitely, your blog needs to have a variety. And I think because of the subject matter, it is relevant to a much wider audience than the UK. However, as we were saying before, obviously the UK is your primary target audience. You know, if you happen to have readers from the US, from Australia, from South Africa, from Hong Kong, that's brilliant. Um, but you do want to have really your primary audience being the UK, just because you're a UK based organization. And as I said, there will be some blog posts that will be targeted really to the UK just by nature of the content. So, you know, if I said before, if you're talking about a very specific UK project or a very specific UK um, government policy with regards to, you know, the environment, then, you know, that of course makes sense. But if it's something a lot more general, then that's fine. You know, not everything has to be about the UK. 
Oh, Josh, so how do you check domain authority? So there is a website called Moz, M-O-Z, where you can check domain authority. It's, there's a paid tool and a free one. You can check it for free, but you do need to sign up. So if you just sign up to it, I think you get like 10 free searches for a specific time period and then it resets again. So what I would say is if you are, um, so when we talk about content planning and you're potentially looking for, um, so in my top tips, I say ask other sites to link to you. So it could be that you read an article and you think, oh my goodness, that they could link to us because this is really relevant. Because you are a charitable organization, it's unlikely that they're going to say no if you ask them. And also it's good for their um, SEO to also have that relevant link. But if you wanted to check, you know, do they have a domain authority of 10 or do they have one of 45, then just go to Moz and you can check it there. Right, so I've got a very quick exercise for you. Okay, I'm just checking the time. Would you like a quick five minute break or are you happy to just move on? And if we finish a little bit earlier, that's fine. Uh, what do you want to do? Let me know. If your cameras are on, no, they're all off. Okay, fine. If you want to just quickly pop in the chat box, um, move on or break, and then I'll know, we'll see, we'll get a vote of um, which one you want to do. Okay, five minutes, move on, quick break. So that's already two out of three for a quick break. I would appreciate a break. Brilliant. Okay, we're going to have a five minute break. If you could come back at 20 past, that would be great. You thought about the blog post? So that might help um, yeah. kind of clarify things a little bit more. Okay, thank you. Great. Right, is everyone back? I think so. It's hard to tell because everyone's on mute. <laughs> um, okay, well, we'll move on just because we're going to do an exercise. So even if someone pops on in the next minute or two, it's fine. Um, oh, hang on. So it looks like we might have a question. Let me just check it quickly. Oh, I'm sorry. It's really difficult for me to pop up this chat box without moving my slides. Oh, okay. It was just a yes. Okay, perfect. Um, right, so I just have a little exercise for you. I'd like you to come up with three blog post ideas or topics. Uh, and I want you to remember that you need to think about what questions young people have on the, cl on the climate and the environment and how would they ask them on Google. That might help you come up with those three um, blog post ideas or topics. So. I'm going to give you until 7.30. Um, if you're done before, just pop in the chat box, done. And then what we'll do is we'll come back and I'm going to ask you to share those blog post ideas or topics with us. Great. So uh, I'll just give you, yeah, seven minutes. Just pop it.
I'm sorry, are we supposed to share the questions or just say that? No, I was going to get everyone to feed them back. Uh, so yeah, if you can, don't, don't pop them in the chat box. <laughs> just say done. Okay, we've got three minutes left. Um, I can see a, couple, a few of you have finished. I'm interested to know though, are you finding this difficult or quite easy? I think I can think of topics people might be interested in. I wouldn't yeah. know how to go about writing a blog no, on. That's fine. All we need right now is just topics like ideas, um, things that you would like to write about that you think your target audience would be interested in. Okay. Uh, I, but from personal experience, have this kind of conversation with uh, people in the youth group I work with. So personally, it's not been too difficult, but phrasing it in a way that they would Google it is more difficult for me personally. I think. Okay. I'm quite used to using academic language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. useless in this sense yeah okay well we've still got two more minutes i'm waiting for a few more people to say they're done but then josh since you were finished first you can share first <laughs> I, I think i echo josh's comment about how would they ask the question um rather than you know i can think of lots of titles well actually not that easily but but with a bit of effort but then it's not necessarily relating to young people um i i interact very little with young people in normal circumstances and we're now not even in normal um and so i just don't see them anymore um and right. that's, not, that's not easy because i'm not connecting to that even student culture which i'm normally connected to more but then the next the teenage level below that as it were age-wise um i just don't see them okay I don't, I don't have family of that age and uh i have grandchildren who are much younger and 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 then children who are adults um no one in between <laughs> and and the families that i'm connected with i'm not connecting to anymore because they're, they're in a wider circle that's just not allowed right i guess though um i'm, I'm assuming um lauren if you're there maybe you can clarify that uh because obviously woodcraft folk has groups 
of children, maybe you could put together some suggestions of topics and ask them what they'd like specifically to know about them. And then they can come back and tell you what they want to know. That could be an option. Um, you know, then that might make it easier for you to, to know what it is specifically about that topic that interests them or they you know, they don't know much about, they want to know more, et cetera. Um, also, I guess, you know, Woodcraft folk, has, you know, they can um, create polls on Twitter so they could put together a couple of suggestions and ask people to vote um, on the topics that they're interested in um, or suggest topics. So I think there's lots of ways that you can find out what would be of interest to your target audience. Yeah, that definitely is, is an option and we could definitely use our social media channels as well to reach out to young people. We're also running a lot of online programme at the moment, so if there was anything that you guys did that was recorded like this, then we could put that in the sort of on-demand section as well and, you know, promote anything through the social media. You can just send that our way. Yeah, great. I mean, obviously, Facebook and Instagram also have polls. Um, Instagram has in their stories the question um, sticker. So there's so many ways that we could directly ask your audience what they would like to know about a certain topic, and then they can actually give you those suggestions. And at least you know you're writing the content that they want to read. Um, okay, so, uh, oh, it's gone past. So, okay, Josh, since you were the first to finish, I'm going to ask you to share your topics. Yeah, it's been a lot of build up. It might be a disappointment. Um, so, originally, my first one was do, do my actions matter at all to climate change? But then I changed oh. it to, I changed it to, do, does what I do matter at all? Okay. I, I think the first one is fine. I mean, I know, I know I said try and think what they would type in. Um, I think we don't need to be like too pedantic about it, but that is so weird because that was the exact topic that I had in my head because obviously all of the climate strike, you know, like maybe young people really want to do it and want to know if that actually is having an impact. So yeah, I really, really like that suggestion. That's great. Have you got any others? Yeah, I've got two more. Uh, okay. so how bad is climate change really? And mm -hmm. how will climate change change my life? Brilliant. Yeah, I think those are really good. And I mean, nice. I'd read them. <laughs> I'm, nice I'm not, not the target audience, but <laughs> I would read them. <laughs> no, that's really good. Thank you. Um, broad yeah. Enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. I think also sometimes when you... So remember I mentioned earlier about like the tree, the blogging mm. tree. So like, you know, for example, one of those, um, uh, how bad is climate change really? Think of that as like the trunk. And then there are so many subtopics that come out of that that you're going to link back to and the tree grows. Um, so yeah, I really like that. That's really good. So yeah, your, your trunk is kind of like a general post and then the other ones are more specific or delve in a bit a little bit deeper or into one topic relating to that big question great thanks great um i'm gonna just go in order so colin do you want to share i know you popped some in the chat box but do you want to tell us what your ideas were uh sorry you said colin yeah yes yeah. yes that's me yes um no, I, I didn't actually write anything in the chat. Um, oh, you didn't? Oh, sorry. No, sorry uh, well, I, I had the same idea oh, as... Oh, sorry, Saul. Uh, I, I had the same idea as Josh in terms of, um, is this really true? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, basically, uh, something around the denier um, yes. story. Okay, um, so like the facts about climate yeah, the change. Fact, or... the facts, or who, who yeah. can we believe, you know? Uh -huh. Yeah. It's, it's, like, it's the same as the virus thing, you know, the, mm -hmm. all these conspiracy theories and so on. Yes. Um, and then um, when will there really be a disaster, you know, or is it, is it really going to happen now, you know, or soon? Or, yeah. Again, the idea, it, it's an emergency and the house is on fire, Greta yes. Thunberg's idea. Well, yes. but the government says it's 2050. Well, I'm going to be 50 then, you know. Yeah. 
mm -hmm. a ten-year-old, uh, twenty. Sorry, no, where are we? Twenty-year-old, or or a, you know, I'm I'm going to be forty then. You know, I'm yeah. going to be an adult. Uh, uh, but you know, that doesn't mean I can get on with life now and do what mm -hmm. I like. You know, um, yeah. it's really important. Is it is it that urgent? And yeah. then something about food, food miles and land use. Um, I mean, I, I think the book, How Bad Is Bananas? How Bad, get bad Are Bananas, rather, uh, is just being updated by, um, it's by Tim Berners-Lee's brother, if I remember rightly. The oh, web, interesting. Web, web guy's yes, brother. Yes, yeah. Um, uh, and I think it's just coming out in an updated edition with new data and so on. So, I mean, it, it could be quite technical, mm -hmm. but it could yeah. also be more like a book review, so that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Um, so the other Josh? Hey, uh, I had two ones uh, and then I was kind of struggling for a third and all the ideas I had for that one have already been said. Uh, okay. But the first one I had were, how will the climate crisis affect uh, children in different countries? Oh, yeah, I like that. We come mm -hmm. up with a better wording for that to get more hits, but kind of yeah. going a 10 year old somewhere in Europe, a 10 year old somewhere in South America, mm -hmm. so a 10 year old somewhere in like the Indian subcontinent and how yeah. their lives will be different now than it was 10 years ago and in 10 years compared to now, um, just to get them to kind of relate to something that's a bit closer to like their age. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. a, a lot of them, like depending on how much they've traveled or like if they won't have had jobs. So a lot of the kind of, standard news articles will be a bit abstract for them okay got it so something yeah. like how does it affect how a kid gets to work mm -hmm. uh, not, not work sorry school um and the other one was how is the climate different when your parents were your age oh yeah okay um, i like that one so similar kind of thinking of when their parents were kids how yes how was their life different and that could be geographical as well um mm -hmm. but just yeah trying to get it more relatable for them okay yeah those are great really good ideas thank you emily do you want to share yours um yeah so mine are kind of more basic just the first question is what is climate change yeah yeah really so, good that would uh, be a really good trunk article in tune kids are with the whole I mean obviously there are some that are more in tune with the issues but I imagine quite a lot of them are not mm -hmm. um and how bad is climate change that's kind of already been said and something like what will happen in the next 20 years and the third one is what can I do about climate change yeah those are really good really really good um I kind of think so for me a heading so it touches on a lot of what you have said but things like maybe like a, a heading that i think a a teenager might google is is it too late to save the planet um because that's kind of a question that they might have i think we were talking about you know is it i think colin like you were saying you know is it really going to happen in 50 years 40 years you know so what can i do now um to kind of help that not happen but that kind of might be the question they would ask yeah great thank you Saul do you want to share yours um, also oh sorry you won't finish sorry Emily <laughs> uh, so my first one is are electric cars good for the environment but it's a good contentious topic with loads of strongly varying opinions yes mm -hmm. yeah second one is how can we heat houses without fossil fuels it is difficult and then the third one is, so I have to explain it briefly, like it's possible but not guaranteed that the government's going to announce support for SMR or small modular reactors in November. So I can imagine a lot of what is an SMR. Okay. Do you think just, um, do you think your target audience would want to know that question though? I'm genuinely asking because I've never even heard of that. 18 year olds. I think okay. That. yeah okay i mean to be honest what is also great about blogging is you know you can test content you know you'll very quickly see if that content is not 
interesting to your audience if they don't, you know, if they're not reading it a lot or they're not sharing it, um, or maybe it needs to be um, written in a simpler way. So, you know, it is a, it's a good opportunity. And as we were saying before, we could always post an Instagram saying, do you know what, whatever that thing was you just said, sorry, I've totally forgotten it. Um, what was it again? S M R. Small modular reactor. That, there you go. So you can ask that question in Instagram and do a yes, no poll just to see, you know, uh, what the audience, if they do know what it is. No one's going to Google this until the government announces it. And if they don't... They I don't. see. Okay. Okay. So I've got something to say on that after we've gone through this. So this will answer your question. Okay. Uh, Saul, can we move on to you? Okay. Um... So yeah, there's quite a few ideas. Uh, a couple of them I posted, like kids trying to do their science homework. How do I pass the test? Why is it on the syllabus? Mm -hmm. um, okay. I had thought about the is it too late thing. Um, I know there's like loads of stuff. You can pretty much do any like what, how, why, where, when question and add yeah. any words that someone might Google. Why is it on the GCSE syllabus? Why, why does it matter to me? Uh, what's the one thing I can do to impact on climate change? Uh, what's what's which is the worst offending country in the world? Uh, why is it? Why is the country being so bad at it? Why do the old people not care? I don't know. Literally yeah. anything. Those are great, and this is brilliant because we're going to talk about content planning just now, and all of you have basically just said enough topics to last quite a few months. So I think you're doing a brilliant job of coming up with ideas. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm just going to move on a bit more quickly. So, Danny, did you want to share anything? No, that's okay. And is it, uh, or you did? You've got, you've got unmuted. Yes, no? Okay. Um, Haryati, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Would you like to share your topics? Yeah, um, it's just same like what Saul said. I'm thinking about a 10 year, 11 year old looking to do homework. So it's how to write about climate change. Okay. Um, why it's Fridays for Futures about climate change and what makes cli the climate change. Okay, great. Yeah, those are really good ideas. Thank you very much. Brilliant. So I think everyone has contributed. Danny, if you did want to, you can quickly unmute yourself if you don't want to, don't worry. Okay, so I've got, I have a very, very quick pop quiz. So just to see if you've been paying attention, which I'm sure you have. Um, right, so very quickly, uh, what is the minimum size your font should be? So thinking about accessibility, is it 10 points, 13 points, 14 points or 16 points. The next question, does adding an external link help with SEO? Yes or no? And then the last question is, how often should you publish a blog post? Is it once a month, three times a month, once a week, three times a week? Great, so it looks like, well, brilliant. So all of you have got the uh, minimum size of your font right, well done. And all of you have got adding an external link, yes. And all of you said once a week. Now, to be honest, that last question was a little bit of a trick one because you could honestly publish a blog post every day. Um, but in terms of SEO, it's, um, you know, the more regular, the better. So well done, thank you very much for participating. So we're going to talk about how to create blog, a blog content plan. First of all, I'm just going to explain the difference between evergreen versus topical content. So evergreen is content that doesn't really have like an expiry date as such. So it's content that will still be relevant and interesting weeks, months or years after it's been published. Um, but that doesn't mean that it can't be updated. So for example, if your blog post is the best learning resources on climate change for children, that is an evergreen topic. It is always going to be relevant and interesting, even in five years time, as long as you keep updating the post with new books or articles or videos. 
so yeah if you that's um that's what we call evergreen content so even some of the topics that you all came up with a lot of those actually if not if not all of them were what we call evergreen content now topical this is content that is content that is news right now so it's relevant in the moment but might not be in a few days or weeks later so um i'm sorry emily is it stephen who's with you i'm really sorry i've forgotten your name yes yeah yes so what you said which <laughs> My memory is horrendous. I know it's SMD, was it? But I can't remember what it stands for again. Small modular reactor. That's it. So you just said it's not going to be, no one's going to be looking for it until the government announces. So that is exactly the perfect example of topical content. Now, that's not to say it won't be evergreen at some point, because if it's something that's always going to be around, it will eventually be evergreen, but for the moment, it's what we would call topical. So topical content is something that can also drive a lot of high traffic. So if it's something um, that you just mentioned, which people are like, what is this? I've never heard of this. What, you know, and they Google it and you have a post on it, then, you know, hopefully your post is going to surface and that, you know, first or second page, you'll be sharing it on social media, et cetera. Um, you know, potentially this kind of post is also really good for getting the attention of journalists. So journalists looking for experts to comment on this, because remember journalists are not experts, you know, they just write about topics and news. So they might see your post and then contact you for a quote or even an interview. So remember I said how blogs can help you establish yourself as an expert, um, you know, or like leader in your thought leadership. So that's a really good example of that. Um, so as I said, topical content can drive really high traffic. And especially if it's something maybe quite opinionated. So obviously, this is quite old now, but I was just trying to think of a good example. So, you know, when um, America said that they were going to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, you know, your blog post could have been why Trump is wrong to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. So very topical at the time, and obviously quite an opinionated piece. So that's the difference between evergreen and topical. So when you're planning your content, it's important to include a mix of those. Um, so obviously evergreen is going to probably be the majority of your content because topical content sometimes you know, you might only know about it when it breaks the news or you might have some information beforehand, but you might only have like a month or a couple of weeks to, to write something on that topic. Also think about having regular features. So maybe like a series, um, you know, you could have a whole series on zero waste or sustainability. Um, I think also um, it's important to note that your blog will have different themes. So thinking of, um, so a couple of you mentioned things like how, you know, GCSEs and how to write about climate change. So more kind of school-based topics. Um, so that could be a theme that's also a, a um, regular feature. Then also think about key campaigns. So these could be your own. So for example, if Woodcraft Folk had a campaign, um, you know, maybe it was about I'm just making this up, but like lobbying the government on a certain um, environmental issue, uh, then you would obviously want to write about that. But it could also be other campaigns that are international. So Earth Day, for example, or Plastic Free July. Um, and also writing about topics that are very popular. So Earth Day, Plastic Free July, those are topics that are um, potentially going to trend on Twitter. So it's really good to have content for that day. So when it's Earth Day, you would publish your blog post probably on the day, like on the morning, and then you would promote it on social media using the hashtag. And then also, um, now this is just in general, having guest posts, but basically that's what you're all doing, I guess, because you're almost like guest posting um, for Woodcroft uh, folks blog. So um, yes, if you had your own blog, 
then guest posts are a good way to get um, another blogger to come and blog, especially someone who is maybe quite well known uh, because then they're going to promote the fact that they wrote this post on your blog and help give you brand awareness and help uh, drive traffic to your blog and maybe get some more subscribers and that sort of thing. So how do you pull it all together? So I know that there are, I think, around 50 of you that are involved in this project. Now, that doesn't obviously mean that everybody's going to participate. Hopefully they will. I mean, I really hope so. Um, but obviously, there's a lot of you to kind of coordinate. So what I would recommend is deciding on your content calendar format. And I'd really recommend Google Sheets. So Google Sheets, um, because it's cloud-based, it means that all of you who have the link can access it and you can edit it. So you can put in your blog topic ideas, et cetera, and it saves automatically. So nobody's gonna be saving over each other. And you can also see if you've never used Google Sheets before, it tells you if there are other people on the sheet and it also highlights the cells that they're in. So you can very easily see, okay, I'm not the only person updating this calendar, um, which is fine, but just to make sure I don't pop into their cell because then you will overwrite what they've done. I think it's really important to come together and decide how often you're going to post and to really stick to that. So as I said, because there are potentially 50 of you, I mean, if all of you only committed to writing one blog post a month, that would mean that there would be almost two posts a week that could be published, which is great. So, you know, I think plan what days and dates you're going to publish posts. So if you all commit to one post a month and you know that you're going to post twice a week, you know, is it going to be a Monday and a Thursday? Is it going to be a Tuesday and a Friday, et cetera, and stick to that. And then get everyone involved in brainstorming content ideas. So we did that just now. You came up with some brilliant ideas. I think also sometimes when you brainstorm, um, it sets off another topic in your mind. Um, so, you know, it's really good to build up that kind of bank of ideas. And what you could also do is on your Google Sheets, you can have two tabs. So you can have one that's actually the calendar. So, you know, it'll be for October 2020, you know, then um, November, then December. But you, the first tab could just be content ideas. And you can just brain dump your, your content ideas in that, spread, in, in that tab. Um, and just have, you know, like idea and who the idea is by. And sometimes you might think, this is a great idea. I don't think I'm the person to write it because maybe it's not my specialism or my area, but it's a great um, idea for someone else whose area that is. So it's good to just brain dump a whole bunch of um, ideas and topics in there. And then maybe if you come together once every two weeks to talk about what, uh, what content ideas are in there, um, who to assign which one to, or if you're saying, well, that's the one I want to write about, then you, know, you can kind of do that. I'd also recommend, which I haven't put it in here, but I would recommend maybe assigning one or two people as sort of the overseer. Um, so someone who's gonna make sure that you have these, you know, every two week meetings, that you know, people are um, putting the content together by the deadline, et cetera. Now, Debs did tell me that if it was gonna be on their um, website, that they would probably be doing all the uploading themselves. So you probably don't have to worry about that, but obviously you need to get the content to them and give them enough time to upload it, to do all the images, to do all the you know, meter descriptions and all of that sort of thing. I'd also say batch write posts. So if you find yourself with a bit of time and maybe you're like feeling like, oh, I'm just feeling really creative right now and I'm going to write two posts. Brilliant, do that. It doesn't mean they have to be published straight away. It just means that you have a bank of content. Um, and what's good about that is just say, you know, someone who said that they would have a blog post by a certain date 
can't do it for whatever reason, you know, they've got some work commitments or whatever it is, family commitments, and they just can't deliver it, you at least have some backup posts that you could then publish, um, you know, even if it's, they were only meant to have been published in two weeks, you move them up. Um, again, organizing and editing photos. So if you're going to be using Google Sheets, you can maybe create a little folder in Google Drive where you have photos that you can, um, because you will source the photos yourself. Um, and I'm going to speak about how we do that in the next session. And you can add them to the folder. So whoever is going to be uploading the blog post knows which photos to use for your posts and has access to them. And then also you need to think about keywords. So come together and have a, you know, a think about keywords that people will be searching for. So we've, you know, they are very broad, climate change, sustainability, um, zero waste, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then make sure you've always got posts that are talking about those keywords. So, you know, you want to think about the keywords as what you want this blog to really be known for. And then draft posts ready to publish. So again, make sure that you have um, all of your posts. And again, you can do them in maybe Google Docs. So that's like Word, basically, that again, it's cloud-based. So whoever's then uploading it can just access all your copy from the Google Doc um, and, up, and then your images and the other folder. And then they've got the calendar to see when that post needs to be published. So hopefully that all makes sense. Um, so I'm on the last slide, but please feel free to ask any questions, but I'm just gonna very quickly go through what we've already said. So it's a bit of a recap. So the 10 elements of a good blog, so think of it as a checklist. So when you're writing your blog post, think about does it have a catchy SEO friendly title? And when I say catchy, I don't mean it's, um, you know, like it's trying to be clever. I just mean, is it something that somebody's going to type in that search box? I've just realized I've got two S's on headings, which has now driven me mad because I'm a copywriter and I hate seeing errors. <laughs> um, does your blog have useful subheadings? So, you know, that's when you're, you know, you're writing about, um, let's have a think of one of the topics you thought um, oh, actually, the one that mentioned something about like children around the world, what's climate change like for them type thing, then a subheading would be like, you know, climate change in South America, and then, you know, climate change in South Africa, etc. Those would be the subheadings. Have you got scannable content? So have you got easy to read paragraphs, heading subheadings, quotes? Um, so, you know, if you've got a really good quote, either from yourself or from somebody else, you know, you can make them kind of stand out um, in the formatting of the blog. Um, and that obviously immediately catches people's eyes. Is your blog informative? Uh, do you have engaging copy in the main body? So, you know, is it interesting to read? Have you got good quality images or graphics? And with alt text, very important. Have you used keywords? So if your blog is about sustainability, you know, this might sound really basic, but it has to have the word sustainability quite a lot in the copy. Um, only where it's natural, but it does have to have that keyword quite a few times so that, you know, the search engines know that that's actually the kind of focus of that blog. Does it have relevant internal and external links? So again, is it linking to another blog post on your own blog that's relevant? Is it linking out to another article or a website or you know, a video or a resource or a book? Has it got a good meta description? So the meta description, you can, um, so it's basically a formatting thing on WordPress where if you don't fill it in, Google will basically just take something like the top 50 words of whatever the first paragraph is. Now, you don't want that. Um, what you want to do is write your own meter description, which essentially tells you what the blog post is about. So, you know, if we think of, um, let's just say it's something for plastic 
Awareness Week, then a good meta description would be something like, um, here are 10 top tips to help you go plastic free for Plastic Awareness Week 2020. So that would be a good meta description. So it's telling people sort of what's in the blog post and it's using the keywords, which would be plastic awareness or plastic awareness week. Uh, lastly, does it have a call to action? Now blog posts don't always have to have one, but it is quite good to, um, you know, get your audience to do something. So it could be the call to action is actually share this post on social media. It could be to sign up to something, um, you know, if you have a petition or whatever it is, um, or even, you know, read this article for further kind of information. And then lastly, no jargon. So remember, you really have to think about your audience and, um, you know, things that you might say in your uh, professional life, they might not understand. So just be very um, wary of using jargon um, and try to write in plain English. Right, so um, I can see, I think there's a question. So let me quickly go to that. Oh, oh okay, it's another question, but thanks um, Hayati for joining us. Okay, so what we're gonna cover on Thursday I said I'm going to set you some homework. It won't be anything too taxing, don't worry. Um, I'll ask Debs or Lauren to email it to you. So in the next session, we're going to do some homework feedback. Then we're going to look at what is good writing, um, how to write for the web, how to write for your audience, some top writing tips, and there are going to be quite a few exercises. Um, where to source images for your blog, because images are really, really important. And it's really important that you use images that are appropriate and not um, don't have a copyright. And then lastly, we're going to look at where and how to promote your blog, because writing your blog is just one half of it. Your job is not done once you, once you have written your blog. The other half is making sure people actually read it. So um, that is all for the session. Um, I hope you found it interesting. If you've got any questions, um, please let me know now. Uh, otherwise, if you think of anything else, you can ask me in the next session on Thursday. Um, yeah, otherwise, I hope you found that interesting. And I will see you all on Thursday.